Okay, so good morning, everyone. Um, my name is James. I will speak to you today about uh, the results that we got with Miakat, which I consider an excellent result. Um, I'm currently at Northwest University, but before that, I did my bachelor degree at the University of Nigeria, as well as my master's degree. I was born in a small town in the southeastern part of Nigeria called Aba, which is spelled A-B-A. And after completing my BSc and my MSc in University of Nigeria, I moved to the southern part of Japan in Kyushu Island at Kagoshima University to do my PhD, after which I moved to Tokyo to the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan, worked for the East Asian Alma Regional Center um, as project assistant professor, working on the Alma project, helping with the telescope commissioning, as well as doing some science with Alma. Um, after two years, I moved back to University of Nigeria as a senior lecturer. Um, then two years later, I moved to Sarao, worked as a ABN VLBI commissioning scientist. And then after two years, I moved to Northwest University as an associate professor. So that's my journey in a summary. And now I will tell you a bit about uh, the impression I have about astronomical facilities in Africa. I will really thank everyone who has contributed to the development we've seen in terms of astronomical development, uh, development of facilities used in astronomy. I could see um, Patricia Whitelock, those who played key roles in these. Um, I'm very grateful for that. But this is one of the things I have spent my time on, which I am still very much interested in, uh, which is to have lots of radio telescopes around Africa doing science and with the hope of doing VLBI, which we will call AVN, African VLBI Network. And the original idea by the late uh, Mike Gaylord was to convert redundant dishes across the globe, uh, across the African continent and get uh, a functional VLBI network. If we do this, we will get as close as possible to the American Very Long Baseline Array, which has the longest baseline of 8,600 8, kilometers. So this is still my dream. I'm happy that at least the Ghana antenna have seen first light, have gotten fringes with other European VLBI network. Hopefully, we can get things going in the next couple of years. Then I'll spend three minutes to show you what my first science interest is before I show you the next interest I have now, which I am exploring, which is what the result I will show you today is based on. Um, principally, I had my PhD doing interferometry, especially the long baseline interferometry. And what I focused on was doing high resolution studies of young massive protostellar objects, exploring how massive stars form, looking at how they evolve from giant molecular cloud, as you can see in the simulation, they will go ahead through cloud-cloud collision and the influence of magnetic fields to form nice filaments. And these filaments over time will fragment to form extremely cold cores, but very, very dense. And then through accretion, the density increases and you have um, hot cores, which will evaporate some of the gases that are frozen onto the dust grains. And this will uh, become what you see in the thermal molecular line with millimeter observations. Of course, this will go ahead to ionize uh, hydrogen to form free free emission. You will see hypercompact H2 region uh, disk will form, and then you will see outflowing structures, low velocity outflow and high velocity jets from the system. The jets can be as fast as 500 kilometers every second. They will form wide angle outflows and of course start burning hydrogen to produce light. But this entire process will happen within a few million years and the star will just explode and die. So this was my, call it my first love in terms of science. And that's what I spent uh, maybe half of my career so far doing. Um, but today I'll show you something different. 
I'll show you a result coming from studying radio galaxies, active galactic nucleus within a galaxy cluster. What we know today about AGNs is that um, in a spiral shaped galaxy, radio galaxy, you would have a central massive or supermassive black hole in the middle, and this could launch relatively big jets. So it's very common for you to see nicely bipolar jets uh, from, from radio galaxies coming from the center, central black hole. However, it may surprise you from today's results to see that these jets, which moves at thousands of kilometers every second, could actually get bent. Um, if you see this in real life, one of the biggest things to think about is maybe something else is driving this other synchrotron emission in this direction. But today you would see that such phenomena is very possible through interaction with magnetic field. Okay, so the result I'll show you will come from imaging galaxy cluster. For those who do not know, um, a galaxy cluster is just a cluster of many galaxies. And typically, as you see in the orange color, would have hot gas around the center of the uh, galaxy cluster. And this it can be detected in uh, X-rays because hot gas, of course, will emit X-ray emission. And if you have these two galaxy clusters merging, we typically call them merging galaxy clusters. Um, and the example I'm going to show you, the result I'll show you came from imaging galaxy cluster called a Bell 3376. But before I introduce that, I would like to show you one of the basic concepts that has been detected in S-ray, which we call cold front. Cold front is a discontinuity that has been seen in S-ray observations by looking at the temperatures from the central part of the S-ray emission and moving outward in some radius. And you notice that the temperature just sharply drops at some point uh, and then rises again after that discontinuity. This cold front could come as a result of the movie I showed you earlier in the previous slide, uh, which is a merging uh, system that is caused by uh, of sloshing induced gas motion could result in such cold front. Uh, for you to have cold front, typically you will find um, magnetic field, and that has been detected in some sources, as shown in the references, that magnetic field around the cold front could be as high as six microgauss and could get up to 40 microgauss. In Ebel 2204, Chen um, et al. in 2014 reported magnetic field of close to uh, 20 microgauss. And if you want to detect this, you can just cut through this X ray emission and look at the X ray profile. And typically, you would see um, the X ray profile decay, uh, typically exponentially. And somewhere at some point, you see a kink, which is some discontinuity. And that's an evidence of the cold front. And how can you produce such um, cold fronts where you have very high magnetic field? Um, Asai et al. in 2007 produced a simulation that showed that um, magnetic draping can be responsible for creation of such um, cold front or such region of high magnetic field that you detect in S ray as cold front. Imagine you have B field, um, B field lines arranged in this pattern, and you have a subcluster field moving in this direction and hitting this magnetic field. This, you have a wrapping around of the magnetic field around this subcluster environment. And this is produced, um, as you can see in this image with MHD simulations. And one of the very impressive values that you can derive from this is that the ratio of the thermal pressure to that of the magnetic pressure can get as close as one um, in such region. 
And this value we call alpha beta value can be as, as close as one. So this is what causes uh, the what you call compressed uh, magnetic field area within the galaxy cluster, especially for major galaxy cluster. Okay, good. So now with that background, we go into the main um, object of the study, which is Abel 3376. Uh, the original proposal for this was, well, we submitted a proposal to study uh, these relics. It's a beautiful double relic structure. Uh, the image I'm showing here is the BLA observation published in Science by Bakchi et al. in 2006. So the contours are uh, VLA-L band observation and the background is XMM X-ray observation. And you can see nice elongated structure of the X-ray and you see the radio relics um, seen from VLA, the, both the Eastern and the Western relic. And then you see this very impressive radio galaxy. So the original idea of the Miyakad proposal was to look at these relic structures uh, to confirm why we have different Mach numbers from what is derived in the radio compared to what is derived in the X-ray. Of course, uh, the result I'll show you now is a spin-off uh, from what we got from the high-resolution image coming from Miyakad. So this is a very popularly studied um, object. There are a couple of optical observations, H1 observation, uh, some simulations and a number of X-ray observations. And I'll show you one of the simulations. And this is from Machida in Machado in 2013, showing how you could produce this elongated structure in X-ray from the merging galaxy cluster. And simply put in, uh, we know the mass ratio of the two merging clusters. The mass ratio is uh, one is to 10. Um, and you could have this come together over a couple of uh, a few giga years, and you would see how you could nicely reproduce um, the elongated S-ray emission you see from the center of the two metal galaxies. I'll give you a few more minutes, quite slow. So you can already see this bullet-like structure, which we reproduce in this place, in this part of the X-ray emission. And you see the diffused part is that, that side. OK, so just try to zoom in. You see a comparison of the two images showing similar morphology. So that was um, a good result from Machado showing how we can produce that morphology. And then um, on Dampileta showed um, detection of cold fronts in, in this region. And um, Akamatu et al. detected another cold front around this, this point okay, with the X-ray observation using XMM image. So the background here is actually X-ray emission. It is important to, at this point, note that um, back to the, they did detect the bent AGN, but because of the poor resolution, it was very difficult to distinguish um, what is exactly going on right here. So they didn't focus on a uh, detailed study of this structure. They just mentioned that this is the second brightest um, galaxy in, in, the, in the cluster. And here is the Miyakat image. The background here is the XMM, the green, sorry, the blue, sky blue one is the XMM X-ray image. The background is VSS optical image. And what you see in published color is the uh, Miyakat image of this region. So in this case, we achieved almost 15 times better sensitivity as uh, the VLA image and uh, three times better resolution than, than the VLA image. So the focus now of this result will be on this radio galaxy. And if I zoom in, this is what you will see. Um, 
there are two galaxy, radio galaxies, one labeled B, which is this one that was not nicely resolved in the PLA. And those who study radio galaxies know that this is a wide angle tail um, radio galaxy with a nice plume structure at the end. But the focus of this um, study is on MRC 066 minus 399 galaxy. Uh, there is an optical counterpart to this galaxy uh, in the purple cross right here. And if you look carefully, you see quite a number of interesting structures. One, you see this nice elongated structure that stretches almost 100 kiloparsecs to the east. And also you see similar structures stretching uh, to the south, uh, eastward as well. So this is a bit surprising because if you consider uh, the major, the merging system, that this measure is moving in this direction. Ramp pressure, assuming there is a jet in this direction, ramp pressure should, on the contrary, push this jet this way. So we should see the inverted image of this if we are to consider the influence of ramp pressure due to this top cluster motion. But what we see is the opposite. We see this elongated um, synchrotron emission moving in this direction. But that's not all. There is still a couple of other interesting uh, emission. These tiny things you see here, uh, they look like fingers. They are not um, noise from the image. No, these things are detected with over five sigma level and they are real emission coming from this. Uh, the most impressive one are the ones moving backwards in this direction. So if we compare this and this, um, having some Japanese background, this is the, an image of the Japanese animation. And this is a site with uh, double side. So we decided to give this a name of double side structure within the radio emission, radio galaxy. Um, of course, this is after reconfirming that this um, elongated structure or this almost 100 kiloparsec emission to the east is associated with this galaxy, as there is no other galaxy within the field to be associated with this emission. So that's um, the interesting thing. Uh, Nyakat was able to nicely resolve the emission, produces double side structure produces tiny fingers, which we think is coming from magnetic field. And then we had to focus on the detailed study of what is going on in this radio galaxy. Of course, the first thing first is to look at the, um, the coincidence with the cold front. So the cold front detected in the S-ray is aligned nicely with the direction where this is bent. So this is the code from, from on the latest paper, and that is from Akama to Ekol. And we can see, well, if you try to connect this nicely, it looks like this code from went completely, just does this loop in this direction. So if the cluster field is moving in that, this direction, we expect some pressure to push this way and this to be on the other side, but that's not what we see. It's not what we see in the image. So we have to investigate why this jet is bent to the east. So one way to do that is to take the 856 megahertz bandwidth and of Miyakat image and split it into a chunk of 100 megahertz, produce the subband images, and then reconstruct uh, the spectral index using those subband images. And that's what this image here is showing you. Um, this color scale is just showing you the color scale of the spectral index. And then using the ellipses around the middle, we have extracted the spectral indices that are along the bent jet of this radio galaxy, as well as the flux densities. So in the plot on this side, the red represent the flux densities, the blue represents the spectral indices. So if you move from the position of the black hole, or the central center of the radio galaxy. Uh, to the north, this area we classified as not one or N1. 
you will see, as you expect, um, a decay in the flux densities, okay, to the north, uh, because of course you expect the electrons to escape and that the intensity of your emission will drop. And this also happens with, of course, with a drop in the spectral index, as you see. However, rather than continue with a decay as expected at this point, you see the spectral index flatten and you see the brightening of this radio emission because the, the flux densities don't continue to drop. They simply flatten, uh, which means there is a brightening of the radio emission at this point. And that is what we call the bend point where you have the double side structure. And this stays flat uh, due to the brightening through N2. And then at N3, it resumes decaying again. We see similar structure for the southern side, um, but as you will see later in the simulations, because of the inclination of this object in the plane of the sky, um, you are not able to completely reproduce what you see in the north, but I think it's exactly the same thing happening there, except that we have a different inclination. So you see the decay, you see some the decay not continuing, um, some flattening and yeah, because of inclination, we don't see the full three uh, structures that we see in the north. So what could be causing this bend? Uh, one way to investigate that is to carry out MHD simulation to find out if we can reproduce the morphology or the bend structure we see for the radio jet and at the same time reproduce the spectral profile or the profile in x-ray and in radio emission using the simulation results. And that's what we did here. Uh, this image here shows um, the result of uh, MHD high resolution MHD simulation and we do nicely reproduce the bend structure that you see. I'll show more details later. And what is interesting is if you calculate the X-ray and the radio profile from the simulation results, you produce this profile that we have seen with a kink here, uh, where you have a cold front, which is due to the discontinuity, okay, or due to the uh, magnetic drift environment, and you see that kink and you see a change in the decay of the profile. The radio profile, uh, what you see below is real observation from uh, S-ray observation, which nicely mirrors what we get from the simulation result or the MHD result. And this is what we get from the radio profile with a meerkat observation. And that is also fairly nicely produced uh, with our simulation. So what exactly did we do? Um, Maybe I'll come to this next. So we simply put in um, a drift magnetic field environment uh, using magnetic field strength of 10 microdals, which falls within the range of what has been observed in um, many papers that I showed you earlier on. And then we inserted a jet and launched the jet um, from this point and allow it to interact uh, with the magnetic uh, field layer. And you see clearly uh, the production of this nice bending of the jet, some of the electron coupling into the magnetic field are moving this way to produce the double side structure and some of it uh, moving in this direction. Okay, so if I go back one step, if you have to think about what is happening to the Joe heating, um, this is the result for the Joe heat uh, the color scale just shows you the Joe heat you get, and you can see in the area where you have strong magnetic field connection, the Joe heat drops um, significantly compared to what you see in this part of the jet. And this is just the Z component of the current density uh, from our simulation. Okay, so here is a better image to show you a four dimensional view of what we are exactly looking at. Uh, we made this with the fastest astronomy supercomputer, which is uh, in Japan. You have your magnetic layer, 
Okay, I always struggle with this, it's too heavy. Just give me a second to open another one. Can everyone see the screen? Yes. Okay. So good, so you have a magnetic layer uh, in this direction and you have a jet. You can see the light blue part is the area where um, the electrons are escaping and this is what will cause your flux density to decay. And of course the spectral index to decay. And right here is where the interaction with the magnetic field. Decay will get to this point and due to this interaction, you see reconnection and you can see that double side structure produced. Of course, Nyakat is so sensitive that this weak synchrotron radiation, well, if you look there, you see the electrons, can, Nyakat can detect this very faint synchrotron radiation with very good signal to noise ratio. Uh, this is trying to flip these in three dimensions for you to see what um, the inside of the band structure looks like. So this is the brightened point where the intensity is flattened instead of continuing to decay. And um, of course, the spectral index also flattens at this point. So this, um, we were really excited when, when we saw this result. And uh, NAOJ was happy to give us computing time to make this nice video for, for the press release of the next paper. Okay, so yeah, for me, I had to detect this phantom emission. I was really, really impressed to see those, which is quite nice. That's a different thing. Okay, so just to use a, a schematic to put uh, everything I have shown in perspective. First, we have a subcluster um, moving in this direction. Therefore, you expect RAM pressure to be moving against uh, the cluster direction. In which case, if this jet is launched in this direction, the expectation is for RAM pressure to push the jet and bend it rather to the west. But that's not, that's not what we see in that's not what we see in the Miyakat image. We rather see this jet bend to the east. And what we think is going on from combining S-ray observation is that we, we have um, magnetic field, draped magnetic field layer around this direction. And this jet interact with this magnetic field form double side structure and of course, the brightening here is as a result of magnetic reconnection. And then the N3 region is just as a result of some of the relativistic electron coupling into this magnetic field and moving in this direction. So that's how you produce that N structure. So the other magnetic field layer we see um, is what we call the cold front and come from a dripped magnetic field. And that is what causes the bending of the jet, the interaction between that jet and this uh, magnetic field layer causes the bending. And happily, uh, the reviewers of the paper were convinced. Um, they asked us to repeat the simulation for a number of magnetic field strengths, and we still got the bending. And um, a week. I think until a week ago, this, the ranking is much better now. The paper sat at 99th percentile out of over 260 publications. Um, but the real question now is, are these the only cases of magnetic field interaction with jets? And the answer is no. There are a few, uh, I think the coma cluster this paper was submitted while uh, our paper was under review. This is also, also another similar case of uh, the magnetic bending. Well, it was actually published, 
before ours, but ours was under review from September last year. And there is also another case in Abel uh, 1775. And I have recently asked my MSc students to commence hunting for this kind of thing, this kind of structures within galaxy clusters. The reason is that we could use the morphology or the spectral structure of radio galaxies within galaxy clusters to hunt for regions where there are strong magnetic fields. So even if we don't have X-ray observation of such clusters, um, if we find the spectral profile of a galaxy showing something we don't expect, then we can mark out that region for further observations or investigation for the presence of strong magnetic layers. And we probably, it could become another strong area of study. Of course, this aligns with um, the SKA goal to look for the origin of magnetic field. So we can start with this. That is not all you will get from this paper with uh, collaborators. We are currently now looking at the rotation measure analysis, which will be led by Sakemi um, to look at the magnetic field vectors around this object using um, the MIACAT galaxy cluster survey data, which has uh, good polarization information. And um, Viral, who is also a collaborator, will uh, look at the relics, these two radio relics, which uh, we hope to investigate the change in the Mach numbers found from the radio observation and the Mach number derived from the X-ray observation. And Akahori san from Japan, we, look, we have estimated the upper limit of the radio relic here. So no relic is detected. We are making efforts to combine the PI data that I have from this observation and the Miyakat Galaxy Cluster survey data so, so that we have probably 30 hours on source um, to search for very faint radio halo in the middle of this. And we are also looking at the H1 observation coming from all the galaxies in this field. And Nakanishi san from Japan will take lead in that paper. So there are a few more papers coming out from this object. And that's it from me. Thank you. I'll take questions. Yeah, very nice talk, James. I'm really kind of mesmerized seeing all these results. And it's like really very uh, pride moment for Meerkat that we have really uh, discovered something which is astonishing. Yes, I mean, we will be having questions now. And uh, very, very first question is from Khadisa. She is asking like what software you use to create this beautiful multi-wavelength image? Uh, which one of the images, this background one? Yeah, the, the one which includes X-ray, optical, and, uh, and I, make, I make them in Python. Mm -hmm. I use um, I use Apple Pie. Um, I also make use of a couple of Pie wrapper packages. So the um, image in Python. Okay, uh, Vanisha wants to ask some question. Please, Vanisha, you can unmute. Okay, hi. Um, thanks, James. That was a great talk. And I think big congratulations to you and, you know, the whole Meerkat team for those really beautiful images and science results. Um, so I think I missed the um, understanding of what actually causes the magnetic field to take on the straight structure. Is it the cold front? Okay, so the... I'll just go back to this. So... Typically within the galaxy cluster, there is magnetic field lines everywhere, right? But they are very, very faint and weak. So you need to compress this field to create this nice magnetic, strong magnetic field area. So if you have um, some subcluster like this, moving in this direction and compressing these magnetic field lines, causing what you call magnetic dripping or wrapping around of the magnetic field, 
as you can see in this image, magnetic field strength will increase around here. Okay, so you need some kind of um, um, ionized gas that's compressed, is it? Yes. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So the region of strong compressed magnetic field is what you would detect in the X-ray temperature profile as cold fronts. Okay, great. Great, Khadija, can you please ask your question? You had raised hand. Uh, just regarding the, the creation of the, um, uh, that uh, multi wavelength uh, image. So when you create it, have you done that based on a uh, positional uh, coincidence or um, when you do the cross matching between the different wavelengths? Yes, yeah, so- you take into account that uh, positional uh, uncertainty? Yes, so we use the position information. Um, we use the position information to match, to overlay the plots. What was the matching reduced? Um, did you use the same matching reduced uh, for all the different wavelengths or depending on uh, the positional accuracy? For example, um, cross matching, let's say, uh, between X-ray and optical. So did you use the same matching reduced? Uh, well, are you thinking about the positional accuracy of the different observational? Yes. Things? Well, when you do yeah, that, this would be, this would be so this would be so small that it becomes nearly in, very insignificant in in this plot. Okay. So the accuracy with in the meerkat image, depending on where you look at. Um, around the center of the point in, if you check position accuracy, it can be as good as 0 0.2 0 .2 arc seconds. So that's really very small yes, yeah. compared to a one degree field. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, any other question, please? Okay. If not, I, I would just, uh, I, I would want to ask one question. Can you, can you go ahead and go to your next slide, please? Uh, where you are zooming this, but yes. I mean, if, you, if we see this, uh, uh, if you see this length of the, uh, length after the band is really very large, how you collimate the, the radi I mean, this bend part of the jet uh, afterward? Yeah, so this collimation, um, it, actually that question was part of the, uh, the fight we had with the referee because the referee kept saying, what if you have just a slingshot, like something hitting this galaxy and then causing the flow of the electrons to change direction? Well, if the flow of the electrons relativistic electrons change direction as a result of slingshot, you cannot keep this uh, 100 kiloparsec uh, collimation without magnetic field. So to keep the collimation of what you see right here, to keep this collimated this nightly, you need this magnetic field layer. So that's what keeps it collimated. Okay, great. And uh, in fact, from the same, I mean, what what were your uh, uh, why you used magnetic reconnection as a scenario for this uh, acceleration further? Uh, well, I know I know what you probably want to drive at. You are assuming why do I say magnetic reconnection is the only thing that can cause this brightening here, right? Exactly. Yeah, because if if it's not magnetic field, we can keep this collimated. So if this is collimated because of magnetic field, then it's obvious that the magnetic field must have extended to this point where the bend started. And if the, there is strong magnetic field here. I guess that becomes the most plausible 
explanation for for the brightening of the synchrotron emission, which can only be explained by magnetic reconnection for the reacceleration. Okay. Hmm. And any other questions from? Uh, no. So sorry. Can I ask a quick question? Okay. Follow up yeah. on your discussion there. So James, is it that the magnetic energy density in in these interactions is greater than the ram pressure, and so that it overwhelms whatever the relative motion might might yes. impart on the yes. on the motion. Okay. Yes, that's the argument. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. So just by way of announcements, um, yeah, this data still has a lot. There are lots of things that we can do with this data. And if any one of you is interested in exploring, I'm happy to work on collaborations using the same data. Great, James. Yes. So if we don't have any further questions, we can, in fact, uh, end the session now. Thanks a lot again for joining. And thanks, James, that you spent time with us.